Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mel. Thank you, everyone, for your service on this uh, on this wonderful meeting. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Young. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic today. Good to see you all. Good to be with my international AA family. Uh, hi to, I think it's Taya and Wendy on day one. You, you don't have to drink again. We've got this beautiful spiritual program of action, and you don't have to drink again. And um, and Don as well. I'm, I feel your pain, Don. I, I'm grieving today, uh, Don, also. And, uh, and and this is the best place to be with my people. Um, I went to a funeral yesterday, my auntie's funeral. She uh, she was like my mother to me. And and today I realised, I was thinking, I, I feel different. And I was thinking, this is the first time I've ever experienced grief sober. You know, and it, and it's good to be able to do that. It, I, I, I can do that today without trying to run away from it, without trying to change the way I feel. And I was thinking about um, the last funeral that I went to. And, and, and just to rewind, like, like, um, like Mel said, my, my home group is, um, is the Sheffield Big Book Comes Alive group where we study the big book, this beautiful text of ours. Um, my sobriety date is the 24th of the 18th. No, <laughs> the Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve 2018. That's my permanent sobriety date as long as I stay close to God and do the things directed in this book. Um, yeah, I was thinking about the last, uh, the last funeral I went to was my father's, and I was still in the madness of active alcoholism. And, um, and I made a real fool of myself. I disrespected my father. You know, I, I, I made people feel uncomfortable. I downed bottles of whiskey. And I know it wasn't me. It, it, it was, I, I wasn't choosing to do that. I don't beat myself up about that today. I, I, I've made amends to him for doing that. But yesterday was very different, very different. I stood up there, you know, I, I, I spoke. And I was thinking about that song that, that was played. And I was thinking if, if I was choosing a song, it'd probably be more reggae or hip hop or something like that. But the word breathe. And, and, and it's so simple, but but effective breathing. No one teaches us how to breathe, but it's the, it's the first thing we do as soon as we come out of the womb. And it's the last thing we do before we die, but no one teaches us how to do it in between. And it's so effective to be able to learn how to breathe. And I've done that through, through, through my daily prayer and meditation. meditation. And as I was up there speaking, and I was, I was uh, you know, feeling I was about to lose it a little bit, because I was feeling very emotional. And as the tears started coming down my face, I just paused and I let the spirit in. And one of the things I said yesterday was in ancient Korean culture and tradition, I'm, I'm half Korean. My auntie was full Korean. I'm half Korean, half Irish, that classic mixture. No wonder I'm an alcoholic. Very confusing mixture to be. In traditional Korean culture, coming from the, the philosophies of Confucius, the point of, of a funeral is to send the, the person, the deceased person, it's, it's meant to be a smooth uh, journey into the spirit world. And I was thinking about that. And I was thinking, isn't this what we do in this program? I try to get into a smooth journey into, into the world of the spirit, into, into a place where I'm not trying to control my life anymore. But it wasn't smooth for me. Because going back to the, the reading, that not the reading, the, the phrase I've chosen, which I will read out of the big book, no middle of the road solution. Because for years and years, I did middle of the road solution, it wasn't a smooth journey for me. As soon as I stopped doing middle of the road solution, it has been a smooth journey, in, in as smooth as, as life can be with all its ups and downs. And I was thinking about my auntie's death. Life doesn't stop because I'm sober. In actual fact, now I'm finally feeling life because if I don't feel grief, how can I feel love? If I don't feel sadness, how can I feel laughter? In, and this is in my opinion, if I didn't experience the lower power of existence, 
how can I experience a higher power of existence? And like my friend James, he, he says, and I love this, and I often share it, when I'm in my active alcoholism, has anyone seen Stranger Things on Netflix? It's like I'm living in the upside down. I'm in the upside down. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I'm in the world and I'm seeing it go past me, but I can't seem to be part of it or feel connected to it or join in on, on the joy and the laughter. I, I, I just, it's like I'm in the middle of a tornado, but I don't know I'm in the middle of it. I can, yeah, it feels a little bit fuzzy, but it's the only life I know. I cannot differentiate the truth from the false. So just to qualify myself, and I forgot to say also, I have a home group, I do service, I sponsor people, and I do all that suggested, like my life depends on it. Because like someone said in a meeting the other day, and I think it might be a, a famous bit from somewhere, and this has been my experience. When I first came into this program, I did so because I had to, and there was nowhere else for me to go, because I tried many, many other things. First, because I had to, and then as I started throwing myself in, it's because I wanted to. And now because I love to, I love this stuff. I love how it makes me feel. I love being able to help other people and all, and all those beautiful things that, that have come about. And so for those people on day one, I wish I could touch you on, on the hand like that and show you your potential, show you what your recovery might look like. Because I remember my sponsor saying that to me and it's beyond anything I could have imagined. And I was very broken when I came in this time around. When I picked up a, an alcoholic drink at the age of about 11, all I knew when I took that drink into me, I didn't feel that pain that I used to feel. I didn't feel awkward. I didn't care about being different. My name was always different wherever I lived. I didn't care about being beat at home and all those things that for years and years I blamed my alcoholism on, which I, I know it's not why I have the allergy. It might have created a very angry and sad young boy, but it, it didn't make me an alcoholic. All I knew, bang, it did for me, like we hear a lot, that I, something that I couldn't do for myself. It took me into this world that seemed okay and didn't seem spiky. And I, I was just seemed kind of happy and content and joyous. But it was only temporary. So I just had to keep on repeating the process and repeating the process until one day when I tried to stop, I found I couldn't stop or I couldn't stay stopped. My drinking has taken me into uh, four treatment centers, um, two psychiatric units and loads of detox units. I was thinking about the psychiatric units today and, and, and this was where I was at. I didn't have any socks in the last one I went into and a beautiful member of AA came and dropped me some socks. And, and, and it was those sort of acts of kindness that did keep me coming back even when I refused to do the work, but I wouldn't recommend that. I wouldn't say, of course, we want you to keep coming back, but we want you to stay. We want you to get well. And I only started to get well when I stopped doing middle of the road solution. So when I can remember my drinking really taking off was um, I was about 17 years old and I flew out to a country called Mozambique in Africa. There was a war going on there because that's the sort of person I was. I like I like danger and I like thrill seeking. And, and I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll join my dad in a war torn country. That sounds uh, like it'll be a real adventure. And I, and I started drinking every day there. Five o'clock. I started I was drinking every day. And my dad said to me, as long as you don't drink spirits, son, you'll be OK. Now, he has given me good advice in the past, my dad, but that wasn't uh, particularly good advice for someone like me. And how I noticed something was uh, slightly different. Come about four o'clock each day, I started to get this feeling of I couldn't wait until it hit five. And then a few months in, three o'clock, I couldn't wait till five o'clock. And then my drinking would get a bit earlier, you know, sneaking around, drinking without my dad knowing. And the ironic thing about being over there and my drinking, it started really taking off, was we were exporting beer. Um, they had a Carlsberg factory in a country called Malawi. And in Mozambique, all the beer factories were blown up. So we were kind of exporting beer and importing beer 
um, which is quite ironic because it, it turned out to be a real a real problem for me. So my drinking progressed as it does. Sorry. My drinking progressed, and um, it got to a stage where I started losing things. And I went into my first treatment centre. Actually, I went into my first detox centre at, at the age of about 30 years old. And I, di I didn't get properly sober this time around till uh, 43, I think it was. So for a long, long time, drinking wasn't a problem. It was a slow progression for me. It was a slow progression. But when I went into that detox unit, I thought all I had to do was remove alcohol from me and I'm going to be fixed. Take alcohol out of me and I'm, I'm going to be happy and I'm never going to drink again because I can see all the problems it's causing in my life and everyone else's lives. But what I notice when I take alcohol out of me, I feel worse. I start crying at films like Karate Kid and I can't control my emotional nature in other ways. I'm angry. I'm intolerant. I'm impatient. I'm judgmental. I can still be those things, but I have a program today. So it wasn't alcohol that was the problem. That, that, that took off the edges of life. But I didn't know that then. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. I just thought I drank too much and I needed to take it out of me and I'll be okay. But what I know today is I needed to be restored to sanity. Now, the word sanity comes from the Latin word, I think this is the right pronunciation, statinas, something like that, meaning whole, meaning whole. So I look at it like I had a piece of the pie missing, which alcohol filled, other substances filled, women filled, gambling filled, all these things that are like food for me, only temporary, because I get hungry again, and then I have to do it again and again and again. And when I came out of that, uh, that detox unit, it was a Salvation Army place in East London, like the opposite of the Priory. There was people walking around in there with wet brain. You know, it was my first experience of, of people that were sicker than I was. Because at that time, I didn't think I was sick. I was a DJ. I was flying around the world. And I thought I was a better class of alcoholic than you guys. I remember going into my first meeting and full of massive ego. I, you know, I had a huge ego. Horrible, horrible, horrible when I look back at it. And I was sat in, in the rooms and I was just looking at everybody. And I was judging and, and I was this and I was that. And which I, I, I still can be. I, I often smile when I hear people say, oh, there's no judgment here in the rooms of AA. I think, yes, there is. It's a human condition of judging. Whenever I see a newcomer, I think, I wonder how long they're going to be around. And I, I hope they're going to be around a long time. And they can be if they, if they live this stuff. So I'm looking around the rooms and I'm listening to people's stories. I'm listening to people say, you know, we've lost our kids or we, we, we've drunk drive with our children and we've done crime and this and this. And I think I'd never do things like that. That's disgusting. But then years later, I've done all those things and a lot worse because I don't have any power of choice over picking up that first one. And it leads me to live in the upside down world where I do drink and drive with my children in the back of the car, you know, I, 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 um, I leave my children in the back of the car when I'm going into the liquor store or wherever it might be. I live in squalor. And I know this isn't a requirement for getting... I was having this chat with someone today about the, the complexities of why some people grab hold of this programme and why some people don't. Because I've worked with people that haven't lost everything, have still got good jobs, still got their partners, but have thrown themselves in and had the same sense of desperation that I had at the end. And I've tried to work with guys who are homeless, who the doctors literally said, if you drink again, you are going to die. And they've drunk again. It, it, it baffles me. But we all have the same beautiful programme. And I'm going to read this bit now, actually, because I think it's quite apt and, and I'll carry on. If you're as serious as alcoholic as we were, and I was paused there and I have to ask myself, is that me? Am I as seriously alcoholic as those people in this book? As Fred, as Jim, as, as Bill? I have, to, I have to agree I am. I have to agree when, I, when I, have, I can see all the consequences, I still can't stop picking up that first one. When I know what's going to happen, I still can't pick, you know, stop myself from picking up that first one. I have that mental obsession that sometimes, at certain times, tells me, do you know what, you've been sober for a minute, you, you, can, you can drink like a gentleman today. 
Sometimes it doesn't tell me anything. I kind of know what's going to happen, but I still can't stop myself. And that's the insanity. And I often use this analogy. You know, that, that insanity of, I know what's going to happen, but I still pick up. Even a five-year-old child, if they put their hand on a hot stove and they say, ow, the next time they go to do it, their brain sends them a signal and they're able to control it and not go, because they say they know it hurts, but not so with the alcoholic mind. It's insane. I was absolutely insane when it came to alcohol. So I'll continue. We believe, so if, I, if I'm as serious as alcoholic as these guys in this book, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. When I think of that, what is a middle of the road solution? Okay, middle of the road solution. When I think of that middle of the road, if I'm stood in the middle of the road, I'm, I'm very likely to get hit by the alcohol, alcohol juggernaut. I'm in the middle of the road. My middle of the road solution was things like going to the gym, was things like working one step about every four months. My middle of the road solution was not to pray, not to turn towards God or peace or love or, or a power greater than me, not, not to be convinced that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success because I think I'm a big shot and I'm a music guy in all this. My middle of the road solution is going into detox units and thinking that I'm fixed. My middle of the road solution is not going through this complete psychic change like the doctor says in the doctor's opinion. And he says, there's very little hope of my recovery if I cannot go through this complete psychic change, which was just explained to me in simple terms. It just means, John, as you go through these steps, as you start living in them, you'll start feeling a transformation in your soul, in the way you look at the world, in the way you react to the world, in your behavior, in your attitude. And that's been my experience. I'm not that hopeless alcoholic I was when I, when I walked through those doors. I'm not that broken person I was when I walked through those doors. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. Was I in that position? Was my life becoming impossible? Not just the external, my internal. Was I prone to misery and depression? Could I control my emotional nature? Was I waking up in the morning thinking, oh, no, I've got to endure another day? Was I not able to see the beauty of life? how God made it. I was not able to see that on my own power. I, I just wasn't able to. I was so miserable. Even as a little kid, I was, I was really miserable. The only time I was happy when I was drinking or I was just doing crazy things. Where life was becoming impossible. And if we pass into the region from which there's no return for human aid, we had but two alternatives. No return for human aid. Profit emotional appeal seldom suffices. OK, I'll give you this this story. I, I usually always tell this when I, when I share just because I still feel it today. I come out of maybe my second treatment centre. Uh, a good meaning person told me if you go to 90 meetings in 90 days, you'll be well. Now, there's nothing wrong with 90 meetings in 90 days. I could go to 100 meetings in 90 days. If I'm not getting into these 12 steps to get to this power, I'm not going through that psychic change. I'm not going through that transformation. I'm still staying the same sick person. So I come out of this place. I think I've been sober maybe six months. And I think I'm well. Got a new girlfriend. I'm bouncing around. Got new trainers. I think I'm really well. Looking back, I'm really unwell. Spiritually broken. And I'm driving down the motorway to see my children, who I love more than anything in the world. Of course I do. They're my children. Of course I do. And I'm, I, I, I've been building up a relationship back with my children, you know, because I've broken it again because of my drinking. So I'm going to see them. Not a cloud on the horizon. Not a cloud. I'm having a great day. So I think I'm OK because my counsellor said, as long as you stay happy, stay positive, stay positive. You'll be OK. Stay positive. You'll be OK. So I'm like, great. And I'm going to meetings. OK, not working the 12 steps. So going to meetings. All I need to do to see my children, who I love dearly, is turn left. That's all I have to do. Suddenly, out of nowhere, or is it out of nowhere? Or is it I've been a ticking time bomb and it's coming? Because step one tells me on my own power, I am going to drink again. But I don't know that at this time. All I have to do is turn left. Suddenly, the thought comes into my head, if you stay on the road, you can go to the liquor store. I am trying with all my heart and all my power to turn left. 
I want to see my children. I don't want to drink. I do not want to drink on that day. Tears are streaming down my face because I know what's going to happen. Because whenever I try and fight this illness, I always lose because it is a power bigger than me. At that moment, my heart is broken into a million pieces because I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen, but still I fight. Still I fight. Bang. I'm back in it. So if the power, the love of my children is not a strong enough power, I need a bigger power than that. I need a bigger power than that. But even then I didn't know. And for the next seven years after that, I'm in and out of treatment centers. I'm in and out of treatment centers. And people are saying things in the treatment centers such as, don't make any major decisions in your first year. What I find out is I have to make a massive decision. Let's think about step three. I have to make a massive decision to turn my will and my life towards God or peace or a higher power. That's what I need to do, but I have no idea. I still think I can do this on my own power. And I'll carry on reading. We've got two alternatives, it says here. And this is what my sponsor said to me. He said, Young, you've got two alternatives. And I'll read it. I'll read it from the book. One was to go out to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could. So when I'm sober and I'm not in a program, I, I blot out the situation, not just with alcohol, with, with other things. I just can't bear to do life. I don't know how to do life successfully. OK, I'll carry on. The other was to accept spiritual help. That's what he said to me. He laid it on the table. He said, Young, you've got A or B. What's your choice? What's your choice? This is what we've got in AA. We've got a spiritual solution or we've got your way. He said, how's your way been working for you for the last whatever decades? How's it been working so far? I knew it hadn't been working except spiritual help. And when I came in this time, because thank God I was given the gift of desperation. And I'll just fast forward to the end. You know that bit in the, in, in the chapter of Vision for You, where it talks about those four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration and despair. I was, I was met by those horsemen every single day for the, the last year and a half of my drinking. Every single day. I, 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 I don't know how I'm still here. Well, I do know through the grace of God. That's how I'm sober, through the grace of God. So someone said, look, you've got another chance. This is why I, I, I love this stuff. This is why I will always reach out to whoever needs it, because I've got a debt I can never pay. I've been spared. I've been given a life that I could not have imagined when I walked through those doors. That's why I was saying to those new guys, I wish I could touch you like that, show you what you might have, not materially, internally. The end of my drinking, I'm visited by those four horsemen. I haven't got any possessions. I, I've, been, I've been stripped of everything. I, I really have. And I'm waking up on this sofa and I feel the light flickering out of me. But I can see today that was the best gift that I was ever given because it was only then. I either surrendered or something surrendered me. I, d I don't know. All I know that that was the start. I went into another I went into a, a, a psychiatric unit and then I went into a treatment center. And then finally, after 10 years of being around these rooms, finally, I got into these 12 steps. I started getting into the solution. And it seems crazy today when I think back. I, I was in the rooms, not getting into these 12 steps. And I remember my sponsor said, Young, if you're going to 12-step meetings and you're not in the 12 steps or you're not trying to get to this power that will remove your problem, your spiritual problem, you won't have an alcohol problem, that's absolute insanity. How do you think, how do you think you're going to get well? But I used to think, I, I used to think I could just get well by sitting amongst you guys. I used to think something would rub off on me. But all that happened, I'd probably just get more resentful in meetings because I didn't like people that sounded happy. I used to feel really resentful of them when they said, I've got a life beyond my wildest dreams. This is amazing. I used to think, I hate you. <laughs> you know? Because I couldn't imagine what, why, how. Because I used to think sobriety men sat around in church halls holding on for dear life, moaning about how rubbish life was, how difficult life was, and, and, um, and, and trying to get through one day at a time. I've just not drunk one day. That's what I thought sobriety was. I know now it's beyond anything I could have imagined. 
like it said in the reading that that someone read earlier on, you know, and it says in the forward to the second edition, it talks about permanent recovery. Permanent recovery. It says about working with newcomers is vital to our permanent recovery. It talks about how they've solved the drink problem, how it's been removed. You know, it does not exist for us. That's not that's not not drinking one day at a time. Doesn't sound like it to me. But sometimes I can say these things and people will, will argue. I'm, I'm saying it's, it's in the big book. This is my experience. This is the experience of hundreds, maybe millions. I'm sure millions of us out there. I used to think there was two AAs. I used to think there was the AAs of the speakers like, you know, Chris Raymer and, and Peter M and all those guys and, and a different AA that I was hearing in, in some of the meetings I was going to. But my sponsor told me to stop moaning. He said, set up your own meetings. And so that's what I did. Because <laughs> I can be a moaner. I don't want to be like that today. I don't want to be like that today. I try. I try. I try and practice these principles. Um, where was I? The end. So I started getting into the steps finally after 10 years. I finally surrendered. The game was up. You know, like Fred says in his story, that, that last flicker of conviction that I could do the job myself had, had, was gone, was gone. I, I knew I couldn't do anything about this on my own power. And I remember when someone said that once to me in a meeting, I really didn't like I didn't like him. He said, there's nothing you can do about this on your own power. And I thought, how dare you? Of Co course there is. Of course there is. I know he was true. I know that's true today. But what I can do, I can I can put in action to get to try and get to this power. I was really scared when my sponsor said the answer was spiritual. He said God. I said I don't like that word. He said get over yourself, young. It's just a word. And I I did get over myself. I'm not religious, but if you are, that's great. I have a deep belief today. A deep belief. It's the most important thing in my life. Most important thing in my life. And why that is, because without that, I don't have my life. I don't have my life without this spirit. I, I really don't. I'm back that miserable person. I'm back drinking. I'm back in the gutter. So I devote I devote myself to it. So I go through the steps. And when, when he said, look, this is this is the solution. It's spiritual. And, and um, what helped me was We Agnostics, the chapter. And there's something like, and, and I'm just trying to quote, you know, the, the guy at the end that has a spiritual experience, the minister's son. And he says something like, maybe I was wrong. Who am I to say there's no God? And someone put it to me like this, and I, and I share it with my guys when they're new in, if they're struggling with this thing. Are you, are you still, if you're atheist or agnostic, are you still sticking to the idea that all these billions of people since the beginning of time who are showing a degree of stability, happiness and usefulness, and they pray and they wrote down about miracles and all these ancient books and texts. All those people are wrong. But yet you, young, you, the hopeless alcoholic who's ended up in hospitals, institutions, lost everything. You're right. And all those people are wrong. And when he put it to me like that, I thought, oh, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I am wrong. And my experience has been, as I started getting into the 12 steps, something started to happen. A shift started happening in my soul. It, it, it really did. And it continues to happen today. Because what I know about this program so far, and I'm still a baby in it compared to many of you guys, it's infinite. The spiritual life is infinite. God is infinite. It just keeps going and keeps going. I'm so excited by it. In the same way that I learned that my illness was was progressive, I, it, it seemed obvious. Okay, yeah, it got worse and worse and worse. So is my recovery. My recovery gets better and better. It really has. Each year has got better and better because I don't do middle of the road solution because I, I I I see how how painful that looks. It looks really painful. I'm I'm all in. My life depends on it. This isn't a game for me. I, I, I really am. It, it says as well, doesn't it? It says half measures, half measures avail us nothing. That's that's very similar to me as middle of the road solution. Half measures. Am I turning up on time for work with my sponsees? Am, am I working with sponsees? Am I passing this stuff on? Am I doing service? Am I doing that or am I doing half measures? That's what I need to ask myself every day. And also the bit I love that it says, until... Until I put my old ideas aside, the result was nil. Now, what, what's my old ideas? Well, my first one was that I could do something about this problem on my own power. That was my first idea. 
But then my, my other ideas, well, there's a lot of I, all my ideas, but the external, as long as I sort out my external world, everything will be okay. As long as I get the right job, as long as I get the right partner, as long as this, I'll be happy. As long as this, as long as they do that, I'll be happy. As long as I'm being the actor running the show and everything goes my way, I'll be happy. I needed to put all those old ideas aside. It says, doesn't it? Which I really relate. To. I relate to all this book, actually. Why wouldn't I? I'm an alcoholic. My troubles, I think, are of my own making. That's a really freeing statement because it's saying to me that the world doesn't have to change for me to be okay. The world doesn't have to change. I've just got to stop arguing with reality. I'm only in pain when I'm arguing with reality. My defects of character come out when I'm arguing with reality. It is what it is. And it's only through prayer and meditation that I can really get centered in reality through that breathing, through that breathing. Everything's okay. So I started going through the 12 steps. Something started to happen. Something started to shift in me. I went through them in the treatment center. The one I work in today, we just do big book and 12 steps in it. It's beautiful. I got out. I found a sponsor. He was someone who was, who was just very kind. He was talking big book. And some people told me not to go near him. You know, but I, I saw how kind he was outside the rooms and how many people he helped. And I thought that looks really attractive. I, I'd love to be like that man. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him and I'm going to follow what, what, what he directs me to do. And that's the thing when I started to get well, when I let myself be directed, when I started to become, and, and many people don't like this word, when I started to become obedient, when I stopped saying, I know, I know. And he said, you don't know, do you? Your I know has got you in a lot of mess. When I started saying, please direct me, please help me, what do I have to do? And he directed me to the pages of these books. And then we went through them again. And I started having another experience. And at six months, I started sponsoring people. And I've always had sponsees from that day to this. Every day, Monday to Friday, 7.30 before work, I'm working with sponsees. You know, and especially now when I'm feeling real grief, like today I was feeling so much grief. What's the best thing I can do? Pick up the phone to a newcomer. How are you doing? It gets me out of me and it fires me up. It, it, it really does. I remember when, when, when COVID hit and my first thought was, how are we going to reach the newcomer? And then this beautiful platform of Zoom came. And I was thinking, oh, this is never going to work. <laughs> How wrong was I? I loved it from day one, actually. Loved it. Because I look at it like this. If you've got a football team, if you've got a football team, think of a big football team to America or UK, and you're only picking your players from the city you live in. People don't do that, do they? Because you'd only have a limited amount. I, I can... I've sponsored more people over Zoom than face-to-face, -face. people that are still sober years later now. And now I can find more teachers because I've got the world at my fingertips. What a beautiful thing. What an added extra. Because obviously face-to-face -face meetings, fantastic. Conferences, fantastic. Seeing you guys, faith, brilliant. But what a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and I just thought of my auntie then, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it. So just before the lockdown hit in the UK, we knew it was going to hit. And I was, I was up in the north and my auntie lives in the south. And I just thought, oh, I need to make sure she's OK because she had dementia. And I went down, I rushed down there and I was only intended to stay for a week. I ended up staying for four months and it was beautiful. And it was challenging, you know, because she's got dementia. So I had to look after her. And I remember one day I woke up and I looked out of the window and I thought, this is one of the happiest moments of my life. And I was only able, I believe, to see life like that because I'd had this awakening. I was looking at the world in a very different way. The old me would have thought, oh, God, I've got to do this for and this and this. I'd gone for a shift. I'd gone for a complete transformation in, in, in my attitude, in, in my way, in, in everything. And what, what an amazing, what an amazing thing. What an amazing thing. My sponsor used to say to me, he used to say, and, and, and he's got... 34 years of sobriety, my sponsor, and, he, and he's still in the middle of this stuff. He still sponsors loads of people. He still does loads of service. He's still the example. He's still showing up. 
he said, um, he said, Young, do you want to be on the floor picking up crumbs off the carpet or do you want to be feasting at the table? And I didn't know what he meant then, but I know what he means today. He kind of meant, I guess, do you want to be holding on for dear life? Do you want to be doing a middle of the road solution where you're still going to be waking up thinking, oh, God, I've got to endure this day? Or do you want to be waking up like I do every morning? I, I'm quite annoying to people. Thank you so much, God, for, for just this gift of life. I can see potential in today. That's what I want. Do I want to be, do I want my recovery to be meh? Or do I want to be rocketed into this fourth dimension? It's a no-brainer. And it's as black and white as this. I, 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 I know it is today. Those who do this stuff get that stuff, and those who don't, don't. And I was one of those people for years and years and years. Ten years, like I explained at the beginning. And it was so painful, so painful. But I must say, those old-timers, they welcomed me back in with loving arms each time. They did. Even when I was picking up chips, when I was still drinking, I was pretending I was sober. They, you know, they, they were just, yeah, okay, come in, welcome back, young, welcome back. And thank God they did. But I could have saved myself a lot of pain. And if there's anyone, anyone back in from relapse, you can save yourself pain too. I, I, uh, I see it like this as well. My recovery, my life like a human-sized ball. At first, when I first came into this program, it felt like I was pushing this huge ball up a hill, and I really had to dig deep. I had to dig deep. But then it kind of leveled out, and then it just started going downhill. And that's what it feels like today. Even when I'm in this grief, it's the flow of life. I'm letting myself be directed. I'm letting myself be, because I've got a new director today. So I'm like, okay. I'm not trying to frantically go upstream. Oh, what about this and this? Okay, okay, di please direct me. So like I said about my prayer and meditation life, it's like we hear in the rooms. I was told, you know, you need to live in these, in these steps of 10, 11, 12, these spiritual practices. Because today now it's, it, it's, it's for me to get a bit deeper in my spiritual life because the, the drink problem has been removed. And I've got a, a fantastic new teacher who, who's shared on this meeting many times. And he's taken me through, he's, he's taken me through these steps again and, and, and I'm having another experience, a, a real deep experience. And um, often when, when um, I, I speak to guys who say they're struggling and I say to them, what's your prayer and meditation life look like? And they'll often say, oh, I, I pray, but I don't meditate. And I say, well, what do you mean you don't meditate? They say, well, I've tried, but I can't do it. It's too hard. And I say, when I first tried to ride a, a push bike, I couldn't do it even. It, it was really hard. But after a bit of practice, I, I, I could do it. And so it is with meditation. I was always taught that it's not about the, it's not about how you meditate or the amount of time you meditate. It's the consistency. Because when I first came into this program, my head was crazy. It was so loud, so noisy. And all I could do was meditate one minute a day. That's all I could do. But then after about four weeks, I could do two minutes, three minutes, et cetera, et cetera. And it's such an important part of my life today. When I, when I was, before I was speaking um, at my auntie's funeral yesterday, I started feeling quite anxious. I started feeling quite anxious and worried, and I was very emotional about an hour before. So I took myself off to a room. I got on my knees. I started praying and, and I started meditating. And I had a, such a strong experience. I literally felt like just this inner calmness just came over me and stayed with me when I, when I was up there talking. The spirit had come into me, you know, because I, I'd invited it and I'd, and I'd let it, I'd let it in, you know. This is the spirit. God, higher power, call it what you want, that I didn't think I'd be able to get to. Because I, I, I've, done a, I've done a lot of bad stuff in my life. I used to be a criminal, a thief, a liar, a cheat, all these things. The alcohol leads me to be that sort of person for me personally. 
And I thought, I thought, how, why is, how's God going to forgive that? But my God is a loving God, a peaceful God, a God of forgiveness, a God that helps me to embrace my flaws, to embrace my brokenness, to embrace my fear, to embrace my anxiety. And that's exactly what I was able to do yesterday. And that's all I needed. All I needed to do was to throw myself into this program, not to do a middle of the road solution, not to do half measures, open myself up to the possibility of a God or a power greater than, express even a willingness, throw myself into action, start in helping other people, and, 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 and these simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet, laid at my feet, and pick them up every day. That's all I needed to do. Who knew it would be so simple? Who knew it would be so simple? And like I said at the beginning, I did it at first because I had to. And like I think it's Russell says, you know, some people say, don't speak about God in the rooms. You'll scare out the newcomer, scare you to where? For me, there was nowhere else to go. And it was only in that last analysis where I looked everywhere else for peace, for, for harmony, for serenity. And I couldn't find it. It was only then that I was able to look in the right place. I was able to uncover, discover and discard and find the gold was inside me all along. And I just need to nurture it each day. So I came in because I had to. And then because I wanted to. And now because I love to. I love you guys. You know, you hold out your hands when I need them. You pick up the phone when I need it. The newcomers always show up, you know, and go, right, you know, direct me. And then something happens in me. The, the, the power of, of one alcoholic helping another is just something I can't put into words. You know, when we say a power, you know, great of our understanding, a higher power of our, or a God of our understanding, well, I don't understand God. You know, I don't understand love. It's a power greater than me. I don't need to understand it, but I can feel it today. I can absolutely feel it today. I think I've got five minutes left. I'm going, I'm going to just do a tiny reading from one of the stories, actually. Um, page 317. Page 317, 317. I can find it. I can find it. So if there's any newcomers in here, I'll put my number in the chat. If anyone wants to talk about this beautiful 12-step program, my phone is always on. My hand will always reach out. When I'm willing to do the right thing, I, 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 you could even change that to when I'm willing not to do middle of the road solution. I'm rewarded with an inner peace no amount of liquor could ever provide. No amount of liquor could ever provide me with this inner peace. When I'm unwilling to do the right thing, I become restless, irritable and discontent. It is always my choice. Through the 12 steps, I've been granted the gift of choice. I'm no longer at the mercy of a disease that tells me the only answer is to drink. If willingness is the key to unlock the gates of hell, it is action that opens those doors so that we may walk freely among the living. And how true is that? Today, I can walk freely among the, the living. I'm no longer in the upside down world. I'm a part of this world. I'm finally connected to you guys. I'm connected to myself and I'm connected to God. I've tasted hell. I've tasted it. So every single day that I'm not there, I'm in heaven. And it's there for anyone who wants it and anyone who does it. I think that's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope someone got something out of my share tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.